Well, good morning. We are so glad that you're here this morning. Uh, and if you're watching us online, which I believe my wife should be, I, I, I haven't been able to jump online, but I think she's there. So hi, Gina. I miss you. And uh, she is with her parents in Akron, Ohio. So uh, I, I know there are several others that, that are away this, uh, this week, including uh, uh, Josh and Stephanie Marshall. They're, they'll be making their way back from Hawaii and then... Um, uh, uh, Sarah Pikes on her way to the beach with her family. So, uh, so there, there's we're a little we're a little on the thin side, but we anticipated this in in the month of July with a lot of movement, a lot of people kind of coming and going. I'm glad that you're here. If you're with us online, I'm I'm glad that you're joining us in that way as well. I, I've been thinking as we talk about more, and, and specifically as we talk about living spirit filled. I've been thinking, what kind of church does our community need? And when I say our community, I'm not just talking about, about Elizabethtown, I'm talking about Hardin County and even beyond. What does our community need? What kind of church does our community need? I, I can tell you what our community doesn't need. Doesn't need another glove, like we talked about last month, that's filled just with hot air. Because... This can't accomplish anything. You guys, those of you that were here, if you were watching online, Sarah tried to play the guitar with, a, with just a glove with air in it. It was, it was ugly. It was, it was not, not recommended, Gabby. So we don't need another glove filled with hot air, or, or worse yet, an empty glove without a hand in it. Our community doesn't need a church where people pretend and posture and perform, and the results represent their, what they can do, their ingenuity or their efforts. What our community desperately needs is churches full of spirit-filled believers, empowered by the spirit, directed by the spirit, directed by the head of the church through the spirit, where men and women demonstrate the joyful dynamic of living and loving more like Jesus. Amen? Our desire at Calvary is that we move from just believing about things to experiencing those things. From what we say that we believe to, to how we really live. Because what you believe should affect how you live, right? Okay? This is what Jesus desired for his disciples. And, and he told them to go to Jerusalem, wait for the Father's promise. And we know what happened when the disciples took Jesus at his word. The promise was fulfilled we read about that in Acts chapter 2 and beyond. In fact, remember that the full title of the book of Acts, where, it, where, where the disciples were used in amazing and miraculous and supernatural ways because they were empowered by the Holy Spirit. Remember that the full title of the book, what we call the book of Acts in an abbreviated form, is the Acts of the Apostles. But Look, we know that that's still not the best descriptor because it should be qualified. In this way, it was the acts of the Spirit-filled apostles. That's what, that's what the difference is between before Pentecost and after Pentecost. So, in, in fact, listen to this indictment that was made in, in, in the city of Thessalonica against the, the, the apostles had come in. They were preaching the good news. They were preaching the gospel. And, and this, is the, this is the indictment against them. Okay? L listen to this. These are the ones who've turned the world upside down, and they, are, they have come here. Now, isn't that what we want to be? Okay? We want it, when we arrive on the scene, we want to turn things upside down. Or, or maybe if you're it, right side up, if you know what I mean. We want to be difference makers. That's the point. We want to be difference makers, world changers. And, and look, if, you, if that's your desire, why don't you stand with me this morning? Come on, if you, want to, if you want to just go through, coast through life, I get it. But if you're ready for something more and, and you're ready for, to experience God, not just, not just um, believing something about God or about Jesus or about the Holy Spirit, but experiencing that, come on, let's stand together. Let's ask the Lord to empower us, to fill us with his spirit and empower us to be world changers. Come on, will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I, as we come into this place, our ears are open to hear the word. Lord, but our, our ears are, and our hearts are open also to what your Holy Spirit wants to do in us 
And God, beyond this place, maybe in this place, but even beyond the, these doors, what the Spirit wants to do through us. So, so we're asking, Father, to fill us with your Spirit. We're wide open. We're wide open, and we're asking you to pour out your Spirit like you promised through the prophet Joel. We're asking you to pour out your Spirit like Jesus promised. And fill us, I pray. Lord, for those of us that have been around Pentecost, those of us that have been around charismatic churches, God, uh, sometimes, Lord, we, we get a little dry. So we're asking for a, a fresh infilling of your Spirit. Lord, sometimes just going Sunday to Sunday, we get a little dry. We get a little dehydrated. So we're asking, we're asking Jesus that you pour out your Spirit upon us. Refresh today. Refresh your people. Minister to them, I pray, and I ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen? Amen. So, so listen, I know it's been really dry. Um, my backyard is mostly yellow. Anybody with me? Okay. That's kind of nice because it hasn't required a whole lot of mowing, but it looks bad. Okay? It's dying. But here, here's what you need to know. Um, you might, wherever you are right now, whatever you've been going through, you may feel dried up. You might feel like, like there is not much that's going on. But I'm going to tell you, I believe the Holy Spirit wants to fill you and refresh you. Okay? Not just on a Sunday, but each day as you seek Him. Amen? Well, if you desire more... Now, that's kind of a catchword for our culture, because I, 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 if we said, I want more and fill in the blank, uh, I'm sure that there are people that would want to put in all kinds of stuff, like, I want more money, you know? I, want, you know, I mean, we could say all kinds of things. I, some might even say, if they were gut-level honest, I want more love. We've been talking about wanting more of Jesus, with the result of of being and living more like Jesus, right? Because that's what it means. To have more of of Jesus means to be, to live more like him. That's the result. That's why we spent three weeks talking about the fruit of the Spirit, because because as we we talked about those, those nine fruit of the Spirit, we were talking about the very characteristics of Jesus, Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, all nine of those, okay? But if you want to be more like Jesus, if you want more of Jesus and you know that that's going to make you more like Jesus, then you need more of his spirit. More of his spirit because Jesus promised, he said, unless I go away. Now, this is, this is key, okay? This was his promise, Uh, The Gospel of John records this. He says, unless I go away, the Father can't send the Advocate or the Holy Spirit. The Father can't send the Holy Spirit. In other words, he says, I've got to go so that he can come. Jesus was limited by his human body. The Spirit is unlimited because the Holy Spirit, okay, the Spirit of God can live in every person in every believer. Amen? Amen. Unlimited. But I'm going to tell you that the Holy Spirit wants unlimited access to our hearts and to our lives. Okay? Because when we say, when we say, fill me with your spirit, God, okay, if you dare to pray that prayer on a consistent basis, when we say, fill me with your spirit, God, that means that the Holy Spirit, we're inviting the Holy Spirit to live in us and to work on us. Because the Holy Spirit is not going to be content to leave us as we are. Amen? How many of you have found that to be true? He did, I, in fact, the Holy Spirit doesn't come just rearrange the furniture. That's what you want him to do. You want him to maybe hang out, move the furniture around, you know, a little, do a little spiritual feng shui. That's what, that's what we want. We want him to hang a couple pictures on the wall that we've been waiting to get up there, you know. That's what we want him to do. Instead, the Holy Spirit comes in like a wrecking ball. And he says, and we say, but I thought you were just going to make me just a a nice little cottage. Like C.S. Lewis said, no, he comes in like a wrecking ball and says, I'm here to make you a palace. Where his throne is the center place of our lives. On our hearts. Amen? 
So in order to accommodate that, he's got to do some work, right? He's got to do, how many of you realize God's got to do some work on you? Come on, raise your hand. Raise your hand. There's no shame in this, okay, because every hand ought to be up here. Nobody, as we said last week, nobody has arrived. Nobody is perfect. No, okay? Because this is what being, this is what being filled with the Holy Spirit means, that the Holy Spirit wants to work in us so that he can begin to work through us. But what if our theology about who the Holy Spirit is, about why he's come, about what he wants to do, what if our theology is just based on our experience? In other words, we don't believe it until we experience it. So I, let me just stop right there because I, I'm, I'm going to ask you, this is an important question, what shapes what you believe? I'm going to tell you that if, if it's your experiences that shape your beliefs, then you're limiting what God can do because we have limited experience. How many of you have ever been to Vienna, Austria? Anybody? Anybody? Okay. A couple of us have been there. All right. I've been there. It's a beautiful city in Europe. But that means there was like three hands that went up. That means the rest of you have never been there. You've never experienced Vienna. Okay? Some of you are thinking, isn't that where the little sausages come from? The little sausages in the can with that jelly-like substance that, you know, make great sandwiches. Okay? Right? <laughs> hey, I grew up on Vienna sausages. Okay? I loved them. But uh, that is not what we're talking about. I mean, you can't experience. There are part, there, there's, there's a whole world out there you've never experienced. How many of you have been to the Grand Canyon? Okay, all right, that's a few more hands. How many of you have seen the Grand Canyon in pictures? Okay, everybody's hands should be up. You've seen them in pictures, okay. All right, but how many, how, how many of you know that the difference between looking at it in a picture and standing on the edge is completely different, right? Experiencing the Grand Canyon is different than the vicarious experience of someone posting their vacation pictures on social media. It's not the same. I mean, you get a sense of the grandeur, you get a sense, but you have no sense of the scope, the size of the Grand Canyon. It's like when we were, when I was a kid and we took a vacation out west and we were at the Grand Canyon, my mom hated hated heights, and she was kind of, she refused to go near, near the, the guardrail or near the, what she called the edge, and she just refused to go, and she was leaning against the car, and this, this, and she, evidently, she was kind of pale, and uh, we, of course, we were kids, we're, we're, we're hanging on the rail, you know, I mean, we're, we're, we're loving it, or we're, we're bent over, you know, I'm, I'm straddling the rail, woo, Grand Canyon, and my mom is just, you know, my dad's going, oh, they'll be fine, you know, kind of typical family outing, and, uh, and this, this gentleman walks up to my mom, and he says, he says, ma'am, are you okay, and she goes, yeah, I just don't like heights, and he goes, oh, Oh, he's a lady. That, that's not height. That's depth. That should just change your whole, your whole perception, right, of that, uh, of that, right. Okay, yeah, just try falling uh, down. You know, anyway, all right. But if you've been there, then you know. So listen, I'm telling you that you can believe in the Holy Spirit. You can, you can say you have a, a theology of the Holy Spirit, which is called pneumatology. We'll touch on that in a moment. But, you, but, it, but until you experience the Holy Spirit, it's not the same. It's just not the same. God's Word is our authority. Capital A with a period on the end of that. I mean, let's, let, let's do this because of the day we live in, there needs to be an exclamation mark after that statement. And you need to, this needs to be a personal statement. God's Word is the authority in my life. Okay? The Bible reveals God, his character, and his redemptive plan so that our theology, which literally means the study of God, theo, which means God, logos, which is word or study, so the study of God, our theology is formed by what, what God's word reveals. And God's word reveals that God is omniscient that he sees and knows all things. Nothing, the Bible says, is hidden from him, right? 
So he's omniscient. We also know that he's omnipotent. That means that omnipotent, okay, that he is all-powerful. He is unrivaled in power and authority. And the, and the uh, idea that, that somehow good and evil are yin and yang, that is not a biblical concept. The idea that somehow that, that, that Satan is equal in power and scope to God is unbiblical. It's not true. Okay? How do we know that? Because that's what the Bible says. That's what God's Word reveals. God's Word also reveals that he's omnipresent. That means he's he transcends time and space. This is a hard one for us to, to grasp because we're confined by time, right? How many of you that, that work have found yourselves watching the clock? You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> I don't, I don't, so you're watching the clock and you're just waiting for that moment that, you know, either the, for the whistle to blow or for you, for the clock to to hit that hour mark or whatever it is, and maybe you clock out and you're out of there. You, are, you live according to the clock. My, my clock woke me up this morning. Didn't like it. Didn't appreciate it. But you can't live untethered from time. This side of eternity, you can't. It rules us. But not God. He transcends time and space. He is everywhere at once, omnipresent. The Bible says he's absolute light. In him there is no darkness, neither shadow of turning. He is light. He, the, John reveals in, in his epistle that he's love. God is love. Perfect love. And as we talked about over the last couple of weeks, he is ever faithful. Those, these are things that we know about God. They form our theology. God's Word also gives us perspective on sin and repentance and redemption and grace. And it's the basis for what we believe about salvation. That's called soteriology. The Bible gives, a clear, gives us a clear picture of who Jesus is and why he came, and what he's doing right now. The Bible says that he sits at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for you and me. That should be comforting. Those truths form our Christology, what we believe about Jesus. God's revelation regarding the last days, the end of days, and Jesus' imminent return we read a couple scriptures last week that I, I think that, that had references to the return of Christ. His imminent return, the end of days, the last days. Where do, we, where do we get what we believe about that? Well, the basis for what we believe about the end times, it's called eschatology. It comes from the Bible. But what about what God says about the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. What do we base our beliefs on in regard to pneumatology? Pneuma, spirit. So what forms your, what you believe about who the Holy Spirit is and, and about what he does, what his responsibilities are? Is it your experience? Because if it's your experience, I'm telling you, if you limit what you believe about the Holy Spirit to your experience, you're going to have, you're not going to experience them the way that God's Word reveals. This is why, this is one reason why I don't believe that the gifts of the Spirit died with the apostles. I, well, that's a good question. Why would they, uh, you ask? Uh, that's a good question. Because if the apostles who had lived and worked and walked alongside Jesus for three years needed the gifts of the Spirit, don't we who have the Spirit of God living in us need the gifts of the Spirit as well? They're just for logically. I know my life. I need to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. Not just so that I can produce fruit. Because see, this is so, everyone's okay with fruit. 
everyone's okay with fruit. Fruit's fine. Fruit's fine. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. I love that. Fruit's fine. But you start talking about gifts, and all of a sudden, everybody tightens up. <gasps> tongues. <gasps> Interpretation of tongues. <gasps> Prophecy. Healing. Oh, I'm okay with healing. So we start. We, 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 that's what we do. We kind of pick and choose what we're comfortable with because it, it, it falls in our experience. But that's not what God's Word says about the gifts of the Spirit. We're not going to limit who the Holy Spirit is and what He wants to do in our lives. If you want more of Jesus, then you need to be filled more with His Spirit. You need to be used more of the Spirit. So we're not going to base what we believe on our limited experience and perspective. We've got to go to the Bible. What does God's Word say about the Holy Spirit? We spent a, the last month and a half, the last six weeks, digging into what the Bible says about, about the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. And over the past three weeks, we, we've looked at the evidence of, of new life, the evidence of new life in Christ. And that evidence is how the Holy Spirit lives in us and works in us to produce the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the, is the character. The fruit of the Spirit is the character of Christ that enables us to effectively minister to others. But we're about to step into our, the next part of our study with a look at the gifts of the Spirit. So I wanted to hit pause today because it's at this point where Christian unity is threatened because many beliefs diverge on this topic. Why? It's because the Bible, is it because the Bible doesn't speak about the gifts of the Spirit? No, because the Bible does. But we're not going to let this threaten our unity, okay? We, you, we, we might have, you might have to leave here saying, I'm going to agree to disagree. But if you disagree, all I'm asking you to do is to read what the Bible says. Okay, that's all I'm asking you to do. Not what so-and-so has taught or preached, what does the Bible say? Not just what your experience has been. Here's the, here's the truth. Most of us in the room did not grow up Pentecostal or charismatic, and you, didn't, you weren't raised and, and, and uh, born and raised in a Pentecostal church. I was. So I can take this stuff for granted in a way that, that might make, me make it just kind of matter of fact. But I, but I can't do that because I pastor a church full of people who come from all different walks of life, all different experience, kinds of experiences, all different kinds of church backgrounds or unchurched backgrounds or de church backgrounds. Or, okay? And I know that, that I cannot take this topic for granted. I want you to know who the Holy Spirit is. But I want us to be in unity on this one. Because unity in the body of Christ does not mean uniformity. Though most of us, though most of us are opting for the fulfillment of Jesus' prayer that they may be one just as we are one. Remember Jesus prayed that in, in John 17? We know this does not mean that we will necessarily all perceive, that we'll perceive all matters of doctrine the same way. Get that. For example, if you read three or four different commentaries on the book of Revelation, you're going to find out that there's at least three or four different views on the end times. That should convince us. There's, there, there's, I, I like what one commentator says. He says, there will doubtless always remain some areas of doctrine and practice on which we agree to disagree. And this is especially true in regard to the gifts of the Spirit. My desire, though, is that you experience the fullness, everything that God wants to do in your life. Not just, and that we don't limit what he wants to do just because it makes us uncomfortable in some way. What God's Word says about the Holy Spirit, fruit and gifts, shapes our beliefs and how we live them out. What he says shapes what we believe. 
So what does the Bible say? All right, let's talk about gifts for just a moment. Because uh, the listing of the gifts are found, are, are found in four primary passages in the New Testament. Get, let me teach for here for a moment, okay? Romans chapter 12, we'll go there in just a moment, verses 6 through 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 8 through 10, we'll go there next week. And Ephesians chapter 4 and 1 Peter chapter 4. Contained in these four books are six different lists of gifts. Six different lists of gifts, cataloging a total of 37 gifts. And there, there have been many attempts to classify the gifts, but our approach should be to recognize that each member of the Godhead, each member of the Trinity, God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit, each member of the Godhead gives gifts. But before we go there, I, the, the question is, if these are gifts from God, then what are we opening? What are we unwrapping? Well, the, the, the very first gift and the most important gift, friends, is salvation. It's the first gift because it brings us into fellowship with God through the completed work of Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, some of you know this one by heart. If not, you need to learn this one by heart. Okay? This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person, a new creation. The old life is, oh come on, say it. The old life is gone and the new life has begun. And all of this, listen to this, and all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Jesus Christ. And God has given us now the ministry of reconciling people to, to him. Uh, the second gift is equipping for service. Equi being equipped for service. Our union with God, our relationship with God leads us to fulfilling our God-given purpose, his plan for our lives. He's the one that makes this possible, the fulfillment of his plan. Ephesians 2.10, we read it. I think uh, we've referenced it. I, know we, I think we read it last week, but this is another one that you need to have memorized. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the good things that he planned for us long ago. Equipping. He makes us new so that we can do. Okay? And then gifts. The word in the Greek is charismata. Charismata. Are you charismatics? Okay? Charismata. Or charisma. All right? That's the singular. Charismata is the plural, the Greek plural. And, from, and, and, and listen, what you need to know is that word comes from the same Greek word as grace grace. The Holy Spirit imparts grace gifts to supernaturally empower us to serve and to minister to others. Grace gifts. Romans chapter 12, verse 6. In his grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. We'll come back to this one. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10. God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. Man, listen, I, I'm just going to tell you, I'm, gonna throw some, I'm throwing a lot of scripture at you today. If you're not taking notes, what I, I'm strongly encouraging you to do is to you, go to the YouVersion app. Go to the YouVersion app, and you'll find my outline there. The bottom right-hand corner of the YouVersion app, there's three kind of dashes on top of each other. Tap that. Go to events. You'll find us. You'll find my notes here from Calvary Assembly of God for this Sunday. I encourage you to save it because listen, listen to me, okay? I don't want you to just take my word for these things. Find out what his word says, okay? Does that make sense? All right, can, let me just stop it. Can you appreciate that? I really hope you can, all right? Because I'm not up here just pontificating about a, a subject that I'm passionate about. I'm telling you, this is what God's passionate about. So let's look at the first two categories of giving uh, today. It, it, it shouldn't surprise us to see a beautiful symmetry between, in the relationship between gifts from the Father and gifts from the Son. That's how we're going to 
we'll kind of classify this. And then next week, we're going to cross over and we'll get to the third category, which is gifts of the Spirit, okay? So let's talk about gifts of the Father, all right? And, and, and we'll, we'll frame it this way, the Father's purpose. What is the Father's purpose? Open your Bibles to Romans chapter 12 with me, Romans chapter 12, and we're going to pick up at verse 4, and we'll read the next five verses um, from verse 4, okay? So Romans 12, verse 4. Um, by the way, if you're in the YouVersion app, you, the, this scripture is right in, in that for you, in the notes for you. Just as our bodies have many parts and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body and we all belong to each other. I'm just going to stop there and say, and, and I want you to just think about that. We belong to each other. I, I know that in his, in, in his letter to the, to the Corinthian church, he details this a, a lot more, uh, uh, this, this idea of the church being the body. But I, I want you to catch this, friends. We belong to each other at Calvary. But it goes beyond these walls. Believers at First Christian, we belong to each other. At Grace Heartland, we belong to each other. Okay? At E-Town Baptist... We belong to each other. So he says, he says in his grace, there, this is it, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, speak out with as much faith as God has given you. If your gift is serving others, serve them well. If you're a teacher, teach well. If your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. If it's giving, Give generously. If God has given you leadership ability, take the responsibility seriously. And if you have the gift for showing kindness to others, do it gladly. Now, now, the, if, you, if you've done any study on the gifts, then you might recognize this category. This is typically called the motivational gifts or the creational gifts. And it has to do with inherent tendencies of each different person, which is why the gifts are framed in seven if and when sentences. I, I know the word when is not in there, but it's implied, okay? So if you have this gift, then do this. If you have this gift, then live this way. If you have this gift, then you see what I mean? The, the then is absolutely implied. So some Bible teachers have, turned the, have termed these creational gifts referencing, and I'm quoting, a person's basic inward driving motivational, motivation or perspective on life. That's why the preface and the context of this listing is so important. Because so much of our self-image, so much of how we see ourselves is connected to our understanding or to our lack of understanding of how God has wired us. How many of you believe that God created you? Okay, hands up. Come on. All right. All right. It should be everybody because otherwise that's kind of a foundational truth. All right. You believe that God created you. But here's the thing. He created not just your intellect. He didn't create just your body. He created your emotions, your emotional capacity, and he created certain inherent tendencies, motivations. All those are part of his creation. So there, there are many Christians who question their worth and consequently their place and their purpose in the body of Christ. They're, they're not sure they belong. They're not sure where they belong. And whether, it's, whether that's because of unfair comparisons, and listen, that's the only kind of comparison there is, is an unfair comparison. The devil loves for us to engage in comparison. Oh, I wish I was more like Kyung, because I would eat Korean food all the time all the time, all the time. 
Okay? Or Kyung might say, oh, I wish I was more like Miss Debbie because I could play the piano. And Miss Debbie says, oh, I, 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 I wish I was more like George. No, no, that's it. That's it. Sorry, George. Sorry. Uh, I, 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 I got to stay, stay in the gender here, okay? Um, sorry. I wish I was more like Jenny because she, you know, she's really knowledgeable about medical stuff. Jenny, Jenny says, no, you don't want all my kids. You don't want my chaos, okay? I, all right. All right, so, but, but that's exactly what we do. We look at people and we say, oh, I wish I was more like them. We compare our lives to them. Oh, they have it so much easier, so much better than I do. Oh, they're so much more gifted. They're so much, I mean, ha, okay, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands on this, but I'm pretty sure we'll have almost unanimous response. If I ask you to raise your hands, how many of you have struggled with this at some point in your life? All of us have. And it's an identity thing. It's, a, it's, it's, a, it's not understanding our purpose. It's not understanding our plate, where God has put us, our place. It's not, it's not appreciating the uniqueness, the giftedness that God has given you and only you. So, so when we compare ourselves to others, it's always unfair. Maybe it's because of confusion. Confusion that's caused because someone spoke over us a word. You'll never amount to anything. That's one of the things that's been said to several of you. I know because you told me. You'll never amount to anything. You'll always be a loser. You had that spoken over you, and you, you believed it. You, you might still believe it. I'm just going to tell you, that's not what God speaks over you. God says, I got a plan and I got a purpose for your life. I created you for a reason. Live up to that. Not to what they said. But sometimes someone speaks something over us, and it, and, and it could be simply a negative voice within us. And we find ourselves endlessly searching for our place. Some believers live, some believers, some Christians live in constant flux from job to job and church to church and in anguish of spirit because they have such a poor self-image. They don't understand, they don't know who they are in Christ, which is why verses 1 and 2 are so important in this chapter. Look at it with me. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he's done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind that he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then, then you will know, that you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good, pleasing, and perfect. See, if you've been living down on yourself, if you've been living believing that you deserve whatever your life looks like right now or you, that, that you'll never amount to anything or that you're, you'll never be as gifted as them or they or whatever, if you live in that, in that place, friends, you are living so far below the promise of God here because God's will for you is good, pleasing, and perfect. But then there's the other extreme. We think too highly of ourselves. We're overly confident, see, arrogant. We're overly confident, arrogant in our, gift, our gifting and purpose. And that pride is sinful, and it taints, it corrupts the gifts and their operation in the church. That's what we read a lot about in Corinthians, by the way. How do I know? Look at verse 3. Because of the privilege and authority God has given me, I give each of you this warning. Don't think that you're better than you really are. 
Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves, measuring yourselves by the faith God has given us. Every member of the church body is created in the image of God. And for this reason, we must respect and affirm, that means to build up each individual member. There's no hierarchy. That means someone at the top and someone at the bottom or some bodies below. There is no hierarchy of gifts where one takes precedence over or is greater than the other. No one is more worthy, more important, more deserving, or more essential than anyone else. You know, let's back up because I'm going to say this again. No one, I can't speak for other churches in our community, but I'm telling you here at Calvary, no one is more worthy, more important, more deserving, or more essential than anyone else. Every believer has value and worth, and we stand equal before God. To believe otherwise is to distort the Father's gifts. To believe otherwise is to distort the Father's plan and his purpose for each of his children. He's given each of you gifts. He's imparted gifts to you. There's seven of them listed here. Somebody, somebody out there is going, I, I didn't read mine. I promise you, there's, you got one of these. Promise. Because these are motivational. These are things that move us to action. These are things that move us to intercede to, or to intervene. These are the things that, that, that create compassion. This is the, these are the motivations that spark compassion in our heart so that we don't just feel pity for people. We seek to help people. We, want, we don't just identify problems. We want to be the solution to problems. Right? See, somebody out there is going, oh, I know what my gifting is, is knowing what all the problems are. And I'm going to tell you that it's not a gift. That's called criticism. It's criticism. It's not a gift. And don't say, well, my gifting is constructive criticism. Okay? That's only true if you spend time building other people up. And by the way, that's not a gift. Encouragement, though, wait, encouragement is a gift. Check it out, verse 8. If your gift is to, to encourage others, be encouraging. I'm going to go ahead and say this one, too, because it's in the same verse. If it's giving, give generously. <laughs> some, are, some of them are going, I know, several people just went, Phew. I don't have to give anything because that's not my gift. That's a whole different sermon, okay? I mean, I, I'm not even going to speak to that. You guys should know better. So that's the Father's purpose, these motivational or creational gifts. That's what he imparts to each one of us. How about, how about the Son's purpose? How about, the, how about Jesus? What is his purpose? Ephesians, the book of Ephesians, deals with the purpose and behavior of the church. That's where we're going Paul identifies the universal church, that's big C, okay? Not Calvary, Calvary's a little C, big C. The universal church as the body of Christ. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22. We just read that in Romans, by the way, as well. But this is what he says in Ephesians 1, verse 22. God has put all things under the authority. I'm going to back, I'm going to read this out of here, so. Give me a second to get there. He says, talking about Jesus now, he is far above any ruler or authority or power or leader or anything else. Okay, that's, come on, if you want to know where Jesus is, this is the passage that tells you where he is right now. He's far above any ruler or authority or power or leader or anything else, not only in this world, but also in the world to come. 
God has put all things under the authority of Christ and has made him head over all things for the benefit of the church. And the church is his body. It's made full and complete by Christ who fills all things everywhere with himself. So, so the gifts for the church listed here in, in the book of Ephesians, specifically in Ephesians 4 if you want to start turning there, are transcendent over time and cultures and still find their expression in the local church community. All right, I, 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 want, to, I want to expand that just a little bit. How many of you, when we read that listing of those seven motivational gifts in Romans uh, chapter 12, how many of you recognize that those gifts are as relevant today as they were for Christians living in, in the pagan city of Rome? How many of you believe that? Okay, I mean, didn't they sound relevant? Okay, so I'm going to tell you that these, this listing of gifts is equally relevant. Not just for Christians living in Ephesus, but for Christians living in Elizabethtown. So take note in Ephesians 4 of the five gifts and their purpose. We're starting at verse 11. Okay, and it says, now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church. That's why we're talking about this. We talked about the Father's purpose. Now we're talking about the Son's purpose, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and to build up the church, the body of Christ. And this will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. <coughs> um, all right. Evangelists, pastors, and teachers are the most well-known uh, and the most universally accepted, by the way, of all the gifts in the church. Pastors, evangelists, teachers. Apostles and prophets are a little bit, little bit harder to define in a modern context. I, I don't have time to break down uh, all five of these, of these gifts to the church. But I'm going to tell you that all five are still in operation. All five are still in operation. Every Sunday, you, you, have, you have one of those gifts right here on the platform. I, I, I didn't, I, I expected like applause there. A good amen. A little bit of, instead of laughter. What the heck? Okay? Hey, listen, I am a gift to you. And some of you are going, oh. Really? Really? <laughs> so disappointed. <laughs> I was really expecting, you know, more. <laughs> okay, me too. All right, so anyway, I, I feel your pain. Trust me. So, so listen, it's important to know that Jesus is the model for each of these gifts, and he intends for these ministries to be expressed and carried out in the church through the various office gifts. That's, that's, what, that's what the son's purpose, and that's what his giftings are about, the office gifts. They represent certain positions. Some, some people have called them positional gifts. But don't miss the context of these gifts. You've got to go back to verse 1 and read through verse 4 here. So do that with me, okay? He says, uh, therefore I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling. And for, you, for you've been called by God. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the Spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. For there is one body and one Spirit, just as you've been called to the one glorious hope for the future. Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Paul appeals to the believers in this way. He says, live worthy of your calling. That's for everybody here. Live worthy of your calling. And then he says, to always be humble and gentle and patient. That's for everyone here. And then he says, make every effort to work together for unity. Again, that is instruction for each one of us. You guys get that? 
But then he shifts and he talks about specific offices or, or positions. But what you need to know is what, what their purpose is. What's the purpose of the office gifts? And that's in verse 12. Let, read it again with me. Their responsibility. By the way, the word uh, now in verse 11 is the, is the transition. Now these are the gifts, okay? So verses 1 through 10, all right? And then he shifts to now these are the gifts, all right? Their responsibility, talking about prophets, uh, apostles, prophets, uh, pastors, evangelists, and teachers, their responsibility is to equip God's people to do His work and to build up the church, the body of Christ. So let me just ask you this. Do we still need these gifts in the modern church? Absolutely. Because to my knowledge, we haven't fulfilled God's goal yet which is verse 13. Read that one with me. This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son. Okay, are we all in unity? Well, we'd like to think so. Okay, but we're not quite there. All right? All right? I, are we, are, can we be that honest? Are you okay with that? I, I mean, we like each other right? for the most part. There's a few people, I mean, that are, you know, kind of on the bubble. But, I mean, we, for the most part, we like each other. We're not quite in unity. That's a whole different level, just so you know. Okay, all right. So let's start again without my commentary. <laughs> this will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring, okay, all right, uh, let's just stop there. Maturity? Mature? Anybody claiming maturity here? It's okay. That's not a bad thing. It's a, some of you are going, no, that's, that would be really prideful of me, but I really want to have my hand up right now, Pastor. Okay, all right, because I feel like I am mature in the Lord. And I'm not talking about how old you are, okay? All right? But here's the real kicker. Measuring up to the full and complete standard of Jesus Christ. How many of you are just like Jesus? Okay? Any husband that attempts to raise his hand right now, his wife will be elbowing him in the ribs. I know it. In fact, if, you, if you're sitting around somebody that knows you, chances are they're going to say, eh, hand down, dude. You are not just like Jesus. <laughs> okay? I mean, I mean, we might have flashes of brilliance. Am, am I right, Zach? These just moments where, where we might be mistaken for Jesus. You know, I... Uh, that has never happened. Nobody's ever come to say, Mr., are you Jesus? No. Pastor, are you Jesus? No, that's never happened either, okay? I'm not there yet. So because we're not there yet, because we haven't reached complete unity, because we're not, we're not all mature, because we're not all like Jesus, because we all haven't reached that same, for those reasons, we still need apostles, prophets, teachers, pastors, we still need them. Now, what that looks like, okay, I, I, well, let me, I don't want, I'll come back to that thought, okay? Because if unity and knowledge are the goal, what's the purpose of being mature in the Lord? What's the purpose? If unity and knowledge are the goal, then what's the purpose of unity? Well, that's verses 14 and 15. Then, there's the word, then. We will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every... This is two different thoughts, by the way. Okay? We won't be immature like children. And, and okay, separate thought. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. Okay? That's another... Here's another one. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever that they sound like the truth. Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who's the head of his body, the church. And he's the one that makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. There it is. 
believers in unity, equipped and fully functioning in the local church, active in kingdom work, that is the biblical church growth plan. So, so if you thought that the way to grow Calvary is for us to maybe have, we need to have like a citywide crusade. We need to have, we need to have outreach. We need to be doing door to door. We need, and and I'm, not, I'm not saying that those things couldn't happen. I'm just telling you that that's not the biblical growth plan. The biblical growth plan is every believer doing their job. I, it's what I just read. You're really quiet. Did I say something that, that, come on, folks. If you expect a pastor to grow the church, well, clearly that's not happening, right? He's not doing his job. Friends, all of us together, all of us working together, all of us doing our part, that's how the church grows. I, okay, i got to read it again, I guess, Okay. Instead, we speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ. All right, verse 16, he makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing full of love. Each of the fivefold team members, pastors, prophets, evangelists, teachers, Okay, and apostles, okay, each of those five fold team members are fully committed to equipping Christians and building up the church. I'm going to stop right here because um, I said the three that are recognized are pastors, teachers, and what? Evangelists. Okay, we get those. But the apostles and prophets are they've not translated well into our culture, okay? And there's some reason for that. If you, look at, if you look at an Old Testament prophet, and then you understand that Old Testament prophets usually worked on the periphery of society, and they weren't real popular, but their job was to identify corruption. Their job was to call, or even we can even cross over into the New Testament and talk about John the Baptist, who was considered a prophet. Not, not, not just by what he did, but he was recognized as a prophet in Scripture. Right? Am I right? Okay. His job was call people to repentance. In this context, though, the prophet works within the local church. Not just in a kind of a national way, because some of you, some of you if, you're, if you're savvy on the Internet, then you've run across some people that claim to be prophets, Right? They've, they've claimed the office of prophet. But they move outside of the church. They move outside of the church. They're not really affiliated with any particular church, or they don't, you know, they just, they, they travel and give words of, uh, pro- that, that is not the office of the prophet, okay? And I'm going to tell you that that's not, an, uh, in, in, in a modern context, that is not something that anybody wants to attain. We're going to talk about the gift of prophecy, it's different than the office of the prophet. It is different. The apostles, now those were people that, that lived with Jesus. They walked with Jesus. They ate with Jesus. They saw him die, and they saw him raised again. That's the original apostles. That was the word ascribed to them. But Paul was not a personal witness of Jesus, and yet he's considered an apostle. So in, in today's context, we, we would say that the apostles, there was, because as we see that their work in the book of Acts, their primary work was leadership, but their work was also missionary work. So the modern missionary is, is, would be somewhat of an apostle, just so you know. We don't call our missionaries apostles. They're church planters, because literally the word has its root in planting, church planting. All right, does that make sense? 
It's a little bit harder, okay? Now, and I know that there are people that, are, that, that identify this as apostle, not as pastor or so-and-so, but apostle so-and-so. I'm just going to tell you that that's usually a misappropriation of the title in our culture. When you hear somebody, and they're usually using that title because they believe there's a hierarchy, that apostle is higher than pastor, and the answer is no. Not in Scripture. Not, there is no heart hierarchy of gifts that we read in Romans chapter 12, and there's no hierarchy of gifts here in Ephesians chapter 4. Can I get an amen? Okay? There isn't any room for prideful prima donnas in kingdom work. Only one person is on the throne. Jesus is still the perfect model for ministry. He occupied all five of these offices in his ministry in some form or fashion. He gently and humbly and patiently discipled his followers. He even made a long-term commitment to his followers. How do we know that? Because he sent his Holy Spirit. Because he knew not just those those gathered, 120 gathered in the upper room, or just those 12, or the 120, or, or us, he knew that there's no way that we would reach maturity without the help of the Holy Spirit. So he made a long-term commitment by sending his Spirit. Because he knows that maturity never comes quickly. Every believer is called into the work of the ministry. Every believer is called. Every member of the body has a function and a ministry, okay? It's not the exclusive calling of a, of a few select leaders. The goal of Christ is for every believer to experience progress in maturity, stability, and integrity. You could read those in Verses 13, 14, and 15. This is how the body of Christ, this is how the church becomes healthy and growing. Maybe this is all a little bewildering to you. You may have never heard about any of these gifts from God, but maybe you're a little intrigued. <laughs> so, Pastor, where do, where do I start? I'm, 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 I'm intrigued. I, I'm I want to see this. I'd, I'd love to see, know what my motivational gifts are. I'd, lo- I'd love to know if I have, if I'm, have an office gift. I'm going to tell you that it all begins with your relationship with God. If you need a starting place, it begins with your relationship with God. If you want God's best for your life, if you're ready to live according, that means that you're ready to live according to His plan and purpose for your life. But if you've been living on your own terms, if you've been holding things back from God, saying, I got this, God, I'll take care of this. You take care of all that other stuff, and I'll take care of this. I'm going to tell you that it's time to surrender control. It's time to surrender control. The Bible calls pursuing our will instead of God's will the sin of rebellion. And the first step toward God is admitting your sinful condition. The Bible is crystal clear on this one. If we confess our sin, God is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. 1 John 1, 9. The next step, we admit our sin, confess it. The next step is to believe and trust that when Jesus died on the cross and when he rose from the grave, that that was enough for your salvation. Nothing that you could do, nothing that you could hope to do, but what he has done. You believe that. You trust that. And then the third step, friends, is for us to confess and commit to following Jesus. To confess and to commit to following him. This usually means a 180-degree turn from your will and your plans 
to pursuing God's perfect will and plan for your life. So our sin, as we've said so many times, and I will continue to say from this platform, our sin disconnects us from God. If you want to experience new life and the benefits and the blessings of living for Him, you need to be in a right relationship with God. And if that's where you want to begin today, we need to go to Him right now in prayer. If you're with us online and you want to, you, you want to pray, I'm not going to pray a prayer for you. I'm not convinced that the sinner's prayer is, 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 is what changes everything. All I know is that when we cry out to God from our hearts, He sees our hearts. Not, not, he doesn't just hear our words. He sees our heart. And if we truly, if we admit our sin and, and we be, truly believe and trust what Jesus did, then we're ready to commit. Okay, let's do that right now. Come on. God, I come to you uh, today, and Lord, I know just in this week, just in this past week, I've pursued my will instead of yours. There have been moments that I, I wanted to gratify myself. I wanted to do I, I, what, what I wanted to do instead of what you wanted. And I know that sin. And I know that that sin separates me from you. So I, I, as I admit that sin uh, today, as I, God, I, I know my heart. I know that, there's, that there are things there that, that don't honor you. So I'm, I'm, ad, I, I'm admitting that, God. And I believe that this is exactly why you sent your son Jesus, so that my sin could be forgiven, so that my wickedness could be wiped clean so that there would be no more stain of sin in my heart and in my life. So I believe, Jesus, that you died for me. I believe that you rose again and that you're sitting at the right hand of the Father right now. You're interceding for me in this very moment. I believe that. And I trust, I trust the cross. And God, right now I'm committing to your plan and your purpose for my life. I commit. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go my way anymore. I'm gonna, I wanna follow your way. I want your will. I pray and I ask this, Jesus, in your name. Thank you. Thank you. Come on, be sure and express your gratitude for what he's done. Because it's not about what you could ever hope to do, it's about what he's done. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen. So let me ask you this. Can you identify your Romans 12 gift? Prophecy, ministry, teaching, encouragement, giving, leadership, showing mercy. Those are, those are the seven that are listed there. Can you identify there are some. We're there, we, we did a membership class not too long ago, and, and in that class we, we gave a uh, spiritual gifts inventory to everyone. And um, as, as they went through that spiritual gifts inventory, it, it helps, it's a diagnostic tool that helps us to identify the gifts, that th- those, those motivational gifts or creational gifts. I, I would tell you that you don't always need that tool Sometimes, sometimes it's people around you that can identify it in you, and maybe you didn't even see it in yourself because it's, it's motivational. It's from inside, but they see the, the results of that. But if you're interested in, in, in knowing what your gift is, if you're, and, and you want, you're open to being used in various manifestations of the Holy Spirit, I'm just going to tell you, if you're willing, God wants to reveal that to you, and he wants to use you. Because those gifts, listen, those gifts aren't intended to be held on to. How many of you got a gift that you got, and you, it's, in the clo- it's in a closet somewhere now? Okay. Don't, if it's somebody in your family, don't, don't confess that, okay? Just kind of give me a little nod. <laughs> All right? I, but, I mean, we've done that, right? 
Oh, how, many of you, how many of you have done this? How many of you have gotten a gift and you re-gifted it? Whew. Right? <laughs> Listen, a gift is intended to... Gina got me a great gift for Father's Day. She got me a, 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 a wonderful gift for, for Father's Day. It's a pickle fork. Seriously, it's a pickle fork. I am using that gift. Because it, it comes with a little elastic band that fits around... Bear with me, okay? I'm very excited about my pickle fork. It, it's, it has this little elastic band that fits around the jar, the, the top of, of the jar of pickles, okay? Because I like pickles, all right? And then it has a little, like a little, uh, hanging off that little band, it has like a little container, and it has a fork that sits in it, okay? So now when I want to get a pickle out, I don't have to go to get a fork. I just unscrew it, grab the little, that's already attached to it, grab the little fork, drip, got my pickles, and I'm good to go. I, I'm using my pickle fork because I think it's a great gift, okay? Amazon, just so you know, okay? All right, I can, I'll, I'll show you. Uh, uh, there, there are imposters, I'm going to tell you. This is the genuine pickle fork, though, okay? Listen, I'm going to tell you, though, God's given you a gift. Use your gift. Use it. Don't, don't, just, don't just receive and put it somewhere. Use your gift. Okay, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to remind you, love must be your highest goal. Love must be your highest goal. Do you, do you desire the special abilities that the Holy Spirit gives? I'm quoting from 1 Corinthians chapter 14. We'll go there next week. Don't worry. Do you feel called into full-time ministry? Do you know what the next step should be to, to pursue God's call on your life? I would love to walk with you on that journey. Where does God want you? You to grow. Ooh, this, that's a different one. Where does God want you to grow? I'm just going to tell you, that's where he's going to challenge you the most. Do you want to be more like Jesus? Do you want to be more like Jesus? Use the gifts that he's given. Invite the Holy Spirit to work in you. Ask him to identify the areas where change is needed. Ask him to continue to renovate your heart so that it's more like Jesus' heart. Amen? Amen. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. We're going to, we're going to uh, celebrate um, communion here in just a moment. But um, as, as they come and as they, they get ready, friends, I'm, I'm just going to tell you, we're going to sing a song that just says, that it's a song of surrender. It just says, here's my heart, Lord. Here's my heart. And I want us to do that this morning. And, and, and if, this is, if that's you, really your desire, I'm going to ask you to, to, to sing this song in just a, a few moments just at, as, as your prayer, okay? As you, the expression of your desire. If you grab your, grab it, your cup and your, this morning, because I, I want us to celebrate and you don't have to stand in, in this moment, but let me, just, let me just remind you, friends. We just we talked about Jesus. We talked about his sacrifice on the cross. We talked about that, that not only did he die for us, but he rose again. And, but one of the things that he did with his disciples is he, is he said, remember. When, when you do this, he says, remember me. So in this moment, I want us to remember, I want us to think on what Christ has done for us because he was willing to give his all. And it wasn't just his death on the cross. He left heaven for you and me. He left heaven. He left the adoration of angels to come to an ungrateful people. Aren't you glad he did that for you? Come on, not, not just for humanity. Come on, personalize this. Thank you for doing that, Jesus, for me. He took the bread and he broke it and he, he said, take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. We do not believe that the bread becomes the body. This is just a symbol of his body broken for us. His body crushed. He, is how Isaiah put it. 
and as I've said so many times, not just for us, but because of us. He didn't have sin, but he bore the penalty of sin for you and me, so we wouldn't have to. Come on, aren't you grateful for that? Come on, will you sit, tell him that? Jesus, thank you. I'm so grateful for what you were willing to endure because of me. First, because of me. You, were, you didn't have any sin. You didn't need to be punished, but you were willing to do it for me. You took my penalty. You took my punishment. Thank you, Jesus, for being willing to do that so that I could stand here forgiven and free. Thank you for your sacrifice, Jesus, for me. Let's eat together. The Bible tells us that at that Last Supper that Jesus took the cup and he passed it and he said, this cup is a new covenant of my blood. We know the word covenant. It means it, it's, it's not just a contract. It's not merely a contract. It's a commitment. And we can be in covenant relationship with God because of what Jesus has done. This is what sealed the adoption papers for you and me to become part of his family, to become a child of God. Aren't you thankful for that? Come on, let's, let, let's tell him that. Jesus, thank you that your blood was spilled for me so that I could become a child of God like, like we sang about, so that I could live as a son, so that I could be an heir, a joint, a co-heir with you, Jesus, so that I don't have to live under the curse of sin, the bondage of sin any longer, but that I could come into your home, into your family. You made that possible, Jesus. And I thank you, Father, that you desire a covenant with me, just like you did in the Old Testament with, with the patriarchs, a covenant with me. I know how undeserving I am in this moment, but I am so grateful to you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for what you did for me. Let's drink together.